do you think we should start? Because I'd like to begin the course to introduce Sasha, although she doesn't need much introduction, as she's known to all of us, and in fact did her BTEC here at the University of Johannesburg, finishing in 1999, before going on to Fitz to do her Masters. She's had sort of numerous impressive solo exhibitions, including, the, I think, one of the most recent ones was Transgressing Power at the SMAP Gallery last year. And then my personal favourite, um, Venus at Home, which is a travelling exhibition she began in 2012. It's my personal favourite because I've been writing about it, as she knows. She's also done incredible public commissions. There's a memorial to Mahatma Gandhi, which she done did for the Sunday Her Times Heritage Project in 2006 nearby in Fordsburg. Another example is her Freedom Charter Sculptures at Walter Sassoulu Square in Johannesburg, which she did in 2008. And she's been working on public commissions more recently. In fact, she's been doing a lot of work internationally. So I'm really looking forward to the update of what you've been up to, Usha. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a great opportunity for us. Thank you, Brenda. I should hire you to do my biography because <laughs> you so well. You know the dates better than I do. <laughs> um, I'm looking Can I just forward to ask this? everybody before we start perhaps to just mute their microphones? Yeah. I'm going to mute my own um, just before we just start, and then we can turn them on when we question time. So thank you, Brenda, for inviting me to this uh, forum. Um, I'm going to screen share and, and jump straight into it. And Brenda's asked me to prepare about a 45 minute talk. I've tried to make it as visual as possible so that uh, the visuals can speak more than me. And I'll talk a bit more in detail on some of the images and less so on others. And if we need to come back to any of them, you can tell me and we can come back. Um, and Brenda, just feel free to chip in if you need to. Um, okay. And from our test, when my screen is on, you can't see me, um, but that's okay. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Is that fine, Brenda, just let me know. Yes, we can. Okay, That's great. Um, so I thought I'd start off with these two images, which were made in 2016, the lithographs which I made with Joe Lechate at the bag factory. And I thought to start with these because they're quite uh, figurative, they're illustrative, and they kind of position uh, what my work is about so, uh, so literally. Uh, and that would be a good place to start. Uh, and then uh, this work is Paul and Brenda's favorite piece. Uh, they actually came into the bag factory to document it because they liked it so much. These are scouring pads. And I thought to begin with this also because it's a good example of how uh, my work is often the combination of material and form and content and how the material kind of leads the work so much. Um, and it's, it's a, a rare moment of color in my work. My work seems to be more and more monochromatic to the, to the, dif to the um, dislike of my gallerist. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to focus on are four recent bodies of work, and I'll jump between them. But just to give you some context, um, on the left, uh, this was the show that Brenda mentioned, Transgressing Power. That was at Smack Gallery uh, early last year, kind of May, June. And shortly after that, I had a residency in France at a place called Scat Maristeng. Uh, and this um, uh, body of work is something that kind of 
continued from my show at SMAC. So I'll touch on some of those works. And while I was in France at SCAC, I got invited to do a, a big installation at the Center for Less Good Idea, William Kentridge's space. And I produced um, quite a substantial installation called Nesting, uh, which is this one here. So I'll talk about that. And currently on show at Witte de Wyth, they're busy changing their name. So it's, it's currently called, formerly known as Witte de Wyth. They don't have a new name as yet. That's in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and this is a screen grab from their website. So that's the most recent body of work. That show opened last week, and unfortunately I couldn't be there for the opening. It's curated by Tumelo Mosaka, who many of you might know from the Cape Town Art Fair. Um, and we're hoping to go there in January when things are more open for both of us as Tumelo is based in New York. Um, and the show has a long run, it's running until February. So we're hoping to, to both be there in January. Fingers crossed that that happens. Um, transgressing power was inspired by something I read in The Guardian. It was an article about Hillary Clinton and so on. Uh, but this, uh, this sentence from the text really spoke to me. And it says, a whore transgresses norms of female sexuality, a witch transgresses norms of female power. And I just thought about women and power and how uh, we are labeled how power is so difficult uh, for, for society to come to grips with when, when it is harnessed, when it is owned, when it is displayed uh, by the female. And so the whole body of work on transgressing power is built around this notion uh, of power and transgressing power. And some of the works make a more direct reference to the idea of a witch, not necessarily a, a person on a broom with a pointed hat, but the idea of power and, and um, associations of, of uh, the image of a witch. So this piece is called She Sleeps Naked, and it's taken from a poem by Elizabeth Willis called uh, The Witch. And in this poem, she describes a kind of characteristics uh, of, and one of the lines says that her breasts will be pointed instead of round. And, and those words are inscribed into the broom uh, where I burnt the text into it. Um, this is another piece from that body of work, and this is called Magic Stick. And in this body of work, so I, I started with brooms, and you'll see a number of uh, broom kind of works, which is also something that I had worked with in Venus at Home. So it's not new for me to be working with these items. Uh, but here, what I had started doing is cutting up the brooms into segments, kind of dismembering them and then remembering them. Uh, and what I quite enjoy about this is the different tones of the brown and how they come together. So this was a very simple object, uh, just where I reconstructed the shape of, uh, of a stick, really. Um, other works in the series, uh, this piece is called Mistress of Obstacles, and it refers to a goddess, uh, which is the female version of Lord Ganesha. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Indian mythology or Indian gods, but Lord Ganesha is very well represented and well known. He has an elephant head. And I came across this female version called Vinyaki, which I had, I had not known of before. And I was intrigued by the fact that she is less known. And Ganesha is known as the remover of obstacles. And somehow she is the mistress of obstacles, uh, which I found very interesting. And so I kind of made this work to, to pay homage to uh, Vinyaki. Um, this is another simple small piece from that show called Twofold. Uh, this is an older work. Sometimes I get my knickers in a knot, um, <laughs> uh, which also it started, my works with the wooden peg started around this time, 2015, where I'd made two or three pieces uh, joining these pegs in this way. Um, this was a playful work uh, playing on uh, malva pudding. It's called valva pudding. 
Um, and this uh, kind of play on the vaginal and the vulva has taken different forms. So while I was in France, I had these serving trays and I cut into them and made these incisions, almost leading from, from this work. Um, and it's interesting that I've, I found this tray with a fish on it that my show now that's at Rotterdam is called Vessel of the Fish, which I'll get into just now. Uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, and the, the theme came from this shape that this almond shape that occurs when two mathematically two circles intersect. Um, but this shape, the vesica piscus, is uh, represented in a number of cultures and a number of religions, interestingly. Um, so the, the body of work that's uh, in Rotterdam at the moment is built around uh, these ideas of an intersecting uh, shape and an intersecting space, uh, but also uh, that in a lot of Indian mythology, it is um, uh, associated with feminine power. So this theme seems to be recurring around uh, female power. This is a detail of one of those trays. Uh, and subsequently I made more works around the same kind of uh, material. These ones are currently on show at Rotterdam. Um, they also speak to uh, the idea of uh, women in positions of service, like serving, um, giving um, a submissive kind of uh, uh, characteristics. Um, but also something that I became quite aware of was in the making of these, they're quite harsh, they're metallic, uh, they're kind of cold. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of violence in the process of, uh, of making them that they, these trays are cut and I use an angle grinder and then forced into shape and uh, bent uh, into these forms. This is a newer body of work that hasn't really been shown. It's been shown digitally uh, on one platform in Kenya, but it hasn't been shown physically as yet. Uh, it's an extension from uh, these ironing bases. And there's a whole series, I think there's six or eight of them where I was playing on ideas of a trophy wife. Um, so I made these trophy backgrounds, uh, boards, and then these various shapes uh, using the irons. Mm, there's another ironing base there. This work is on at uh, Rotterdam. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't quite want to make a, a spider. So he's, he's got six legs or she has six legs. Uh, but I quite like the idea of a creature um, and how we are creatures of habit, uh, which is a theme that has been with me since uh, student routine and daily kind of uh, practice. Mm, that's a detail of creature of habit. I, I can imagine a whole room of creatures, creatures of habits. <laughs> Um, Daniela Gio was here in 2018 and um, curated an exhibition of uh, artists from the bag factory, current and previous. Uh, it was at, U at the UJ gallery. And I made this piece called Sparkling Sweeper, the one on the floor. In the background is uh, Pat McLeod's work. And this piece was meant to be a wall piece. And at the time of installation, it didn't do what I wanted it to do. And I had not considered uh, the structure carefully enough. So it was, we resorted to putting it on the floor and making it a floor piece. But I was not happy with myself for not uh, resolving this technically. And so a year later at Transgressing Power, I had played with this and experimented a lot to try and use these objects to create a uh, three-dimensional form. Um, uh, this one relates again to ideas of power and it's called Her Latent Power Lies Dormant. Mm, it's quite a large piece, it's almost two meters high. Just 
So. And then I made a few, I think I made three uh, nests. Uh, at that time, they were called home. And this was now a wall piece, which was, which was what I was trying to do uh, for Daniela's show, which was called Trance, interestingly enough. Um, and so this piece sat on the wall. And while I was installing it at Smack Gallery, I had a feeling that I would love to make an entire installation of these uh, nests. Um, and so when I was in France and I got invited to, to do something at Kentridge's space, I uh, looked at the brief and, and this idea of mine fitted so well with it uh, that I proposed to make this a large installation and they uh, supported me in doing so. And it was so wonderful for me to be able to realize something that I had a vision for uh, that was able to to happen. So I had made. I think, <laughs> I made about sixty uh, something of these nests in the space of like two months, and these were installed uh, at the center. There's a stairway going up, which you can see uh, from this side. This is the uh, view from the other side. And I just filled this entire space with all these nests. Um, what was quite amazing is that they still have uh, the smell of uh, fresh grass. Um, they have these uh, holes or orifices that are quite bodily. Uh, they have so many references. Of, many people have spoken about them in different terms. Um, it was quite an immersive kind of uh, exp experiential artwork. Um, parts of it have now gone to Rotterdam, and about half of them will be shown on my solo coming up at Smack in Cape Town on the 9th of Jan. Um, so they, they're going places. Um, in the foyer of the Center for Less Good Idea, I made this huge broom. So the head of the broom is here, and then it extends all the way in curves. So you can see on this one, there's a big curve here. And this broom is made um, by uh, joining these segmented pieces. All together, it's 12 meters long. It kind of hovered in this space like this, uh, this very, and it's called a long broom. <laughs> Mm, and before that, in France, I had made a smaller version of that. Um, it's called True to Its Nature, and it refers to a story about a, about a scorpion that uh, once, I don't know if you know the story, but the scorpion wants to cross the river uh, and asks the dog if it can jump on its back to go across the river, and the dog says that I can't do that because I know that you will sting me. And the scorpion says, oh, but I really need to go across. Please, can you take me across? And so the dog agrees, takes the scorpion to the other side of the river. And of course, the scorpion stings the dog. And the frog who watched the whole thing says to the, uh, to the dog, uh, says to the scorpion, why did you do this? And the scorpion says, it's in my nature. And then the frog says to the dog, you knew that this was going to happen. Why did you agree to this? And the dog said, it's in my nature to, to help. Um, so that's the story behind the work. And it was purely inspired by the shape of the, of the broom. Uh, interestingly enough, after having just done a body of work around witches, uh, when I was photographing this, this little black cat came into the picture. Uh, that show in France was uh, titled in French, and it's called uh, Un Ballet Pourquoi Pas Une Ballet. I had to learn to say that, which essentially means why is a broom male? I was quite intrigued in France how all objects are genderized, um, which is very similar to Hindi and Gujarati in a way. Um, there's no clear rule as to why your object is male or female. One just kind of has to know what it is. There's some kind of thing around strength and fragility and so on. But I just found it interesting that the broom is masculine. And so 
the the show was based around uh, this phenomenon in language and being in France. Uh, that's a broomstick. I had collected broomsticks from uh, the dechetterie, which is like a dump where people very neatly and cleanly sort and uh, dump all the unwanted stuff. Um, and also people in the community donated their used brooms. Um, so it has this kind of collective identity as well. This was another broom that I found and I had uh, nailed into it these thousands of uh, nails which are found on the on horseshoes. And I my thinking around this was how uh, horses are domesticated and how in nature, like wild horses don't actually wear shoes, that the whole idea of shoes for horses is a, is a man-made idea around the domestication of the animal uh, and how a woman are in many ways uh, domesticated. So I played with this idea and made this piece called Over Domesticated. Uh, again, a lot of people commented on how this object was quite uh, violent uh, or aggressive and that it was a bit like a weapon. Um, and then I made a series of pieces with these brooms that were cut up. Um, and I found these uh, taps. So I built, I wanted something that was not a uh, wall piece. I wanted something that was quite sculptural. And so I built these long, uh, very tall works uh, where these brooms came out like water. Um, and I spent hours and hours cutting up and sanding all these brooms and threading them. There's some other work in the same series. Uh, this is jumping back to transgressing power. This is where this technique of cutting up brooms and joining kind of started. And then I took it further while I was in France. And then when I had cut up all these brooms, all the ends were left. And I was looking at all these ends and I was just thinking about how phallic they all were. Um, and then I had all these trays lying around. So I put them together and I made a serving of broom heads. <laughs> um, another view of them. This is a piece that, it's, uh, that is in Rotterdam and I just wanted to show you how uh, these segmented pieces have developed into other forms. Cornucopia refers to um, a vessel that, um, that uh, represents abundance. And here the vessel is kind of closed. So although it's, it wants to be abundant, uh, I'm kind of negating that quality for it. It's quite a large piece. Yeah, it's 1.7 meters long. Mm, these are irons that I cast in cement and I purposely uh, played with incorrect mix mixtures of cement uh, because I wanted them to be imperfect. Um, and so I, I uh, ended with a number of irons that are, um, that, yeah, are quite imperfect. They, they're quite solid, but they uh, don't hold the form as clearly enough, but they're recognizable enough to still stand as an as a iron. Uh, and a year before that, I made this large two meter iron uh, that was shown at the Dakar Biennale. Um, and it was because of this piece that I, that I got awarded the residency in France. Um, so it's quite a nice uh, shift from working on a very large scale to a, a smaller uh, life-size scale. Uh, while I was in France, I had to make one public artwork that goes into their sculpture garden. And so I made uh, this three meter 
uh, it's almost like a line drawing. It's made out of steel, this three meter peg. And in the center where the spring should be here, um, that's made with uh, horseshoes. So it ties into the other work that was shown in the, in the gallery space. I've made a number of pieces that look very much like this out of pegs. Um, this one is called tiny tears or tiny tears. Uh, the word, uh, I don't know what you call a word that is spelled the same but can be pronounced differently. Mm. Anyhow, that's one of those pieces. More peg works. This is a work that's uh, in Rotterdam at the moment. It's called Lobe. And if you see the almond shape is present uh, in this piece. So when I made it lobe, I made a second piece that sits on the wall across it called twisted lobe. Um, many have commented on the skin-like quality of these works, that uh, the brown kind of pixelated feeling, uh, although they pegs and they're quite hard, um, something about their color and their texture has a skin-like resemblance. Um, this is something that's currently in production. It's a huge half a peg called Resurrection of the Clothes Peg. It was meant to be shown at Burning Man in Nevada this year. Uh, Burning Man itself as an event was canceled. So it will be shown next year. It's made from steel pipes. Uh, at an angle, it's 12 meters high. Uh, the actual length is about 15 meters and it weighs 13 tons. It's also got a little viewing deck here. Uh, on the side here, we've built a, a ladder where one can climb up and sit inside here. And I'm quite looking forward to, <laughs> I don't know, I'm a bit scared also of going to Burning Man because I think it might be a bit of an extreme culture for me. But anyway, that'll happen next year. And then I thought I'd end with uh, the series that I started with, uh, which was made with that same lithograph series. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joshua. Oh, I think I went too fast. <laughs> Just go quite promptly and efficiently. <laughs> so give us time for questions. And I'm sure there are lots of questions. It's been really lovely to see your latest works. Um, I'm going to let other people ask before I ask. Okay, I can also go back to some if you want to uh, look at anything while we talk. Cool. People, what would you like to know? I was just um, wondering, um, in those uh, looking at Burning Man, which is was really quite extraordinary, given everything that came bef that you showed before, where um, you 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 go from using very lightweight objects or accumulations of lightweight objects, and they they mostly light in color as well, and then you go to this huge and heavy and erect Burning Man. What what <laughs> was the what was the train of thought that took you from point A to point Z. <laughs> well, firstly, the works look light. So, for example, the the peg works that uh, the wall pieces, they're quite heavy. Um, inside the 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 way the pegs are joined, inside there's uh, wires that run through each line. There's also a metal mesh on the back that supports the whole work. So actually they're not very light. They look light, but they're quite heavy. Uh, currently I'm working with ironing bases. I bought three tons of ironing bases from a, a recycling place, an, an entire skip full. <laughs> and they also, I'm busy making these angel wings with these ironing bases, but they're also quite heavy. So there's the illusion of lightness, but they're not actually yes. light. But the thinking around it was uh, that this is a, a, a metaphor that I've been working with so much, the peg. And um, their theme was titled around a word called pataphysical. And pataphysical means 
something around like an impossible solution or a solution to an impossible problem. And because I work with these pegs so much, I thought about how when you open the peg up and you take the spring out, like half a peg is quite useless. Uh, like what can you, like the whole function of the peg that is there to, to hold things together is, it, it can't do that anymore. So that was my thinking around it. And um, I've also been speaking about it as the, the resurrection of the female voice. Uh, but I played with the idea of something that's quite erect, very purposefully. <laughs> Ushia, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Um, is it going to be burnt? It's not going to be burnt. Uh, it's not in the burning section. Uh, they've got different sections. And I was quite um, uh, honored to be selected as one of the honoraria artists. So that means that you, it's supported by the Burning Man. You do get a small uh, honorarium for, that goes towards production, but also you're part of the main program uh, and you get treated, I think, a bit more specially than artists who are on the fringe. It's like a main and a fringe thing. Um, so it's not in the burning section. And the idea also is to travel the work from Burning Man to uh, 154 London. So it'll show at Somerset House in the, in the courtyard, wow. which is a bit of a logistical nightmare because uh, it's too heavy to fly, even in pieces. Uh, and the time frame between Burning Man and 154 is quite short to ship it, uh, but we're trying to find ways around it. Also, it's, I mean, it's 13 tons. Uh, that's without packaging, so. <laughs> it's very exciting, though. Yes. Yeah, it, what what intrigues me also is you your works are so much a play on ideas and words, which of course are not uh, physical things, but your work itself turns out so tactile. Mm. So you've got it in my mind anyway. At, at first, at first encounter, I see them as embodying two such very different concepts. You mean the public artwork and the kind of uh, more smaller works, or no? No, I mean uh, all all your your well, let's, let's say the pig pieces, which um, some of them are plays w w plays on words, which are which are abstract concepts, yes. but then you realize those in such a such physical and tactile form. It's it's almost looking at a strange underwater growth or a sea creature or something. It's it, it has such a kind of physical presence. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to From that. From the abstract to the, to the tactile, it's... Tactile, um, yeah. I think that's what makes them very rich for me. Thank you. I think my process also has got something to do with that. Um, uh, and I have a, a dual process that at some point finds some kind of uh, common ground where a lot of it happens in my head so there's mm -hmm. a lot of um, conceptualizing and then there's a lot of physical playing, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit more intuitive, I guess. And these two come together at some point, which is why there's the, the word play and then the, mm. the tangibility of it. That ties into the question I wanted to ask you, is whether the title is to find before you start during the making or afterwards? It, some, it just depends. Sometimes uh, before, never after. Sometimes before and sometimes during. So for example, at the moment, I'm uh, working towards my solo uh, for Smack Cape Town. That will open in Jan next year. And I had quite a clearly defined uh, concept that I wanted to work towards. And now the space that has been allocated to me has shifted and some other things have changed. So it's thrown my world upside down a bit. <laughs> um, but then I came across a text, a very interesting text that often there's like a spark or something that just kind of clicks or something that yeah. just makes sense. And this text just fits right so clearly into uh, what I'm thinking and where I'm going that now I'm building the work around this text. 
it's a it's an excerpt from a uh, a speech that Virginia Woolf gave uh, where she was asked to speak about the profession of woman. And she talks about how uh, it's easy to be a writer as a woman, of course, given the context of, the, of her time, right? Uh, where it's easy to be a writer because it doesn't cost a lot of money. The paper and ink is very cheap. And so she's not burdening anybody with the cost of her profession. And she can kind of do it between other things. But then she references a very uh, uh, older text called The Angel of the House. I can't remember who the, the author of this is. And it's, a, it's a, a big text. It's a whole book where he describes the angel of the house as this ideal woman who is not only submissive, but she's passionate about serving. Like she puts all her needs second. Like her, she's, she lives to serve her man, essentially. And so Virginia Woolf talks about how she uh, is busy writing and the phantom of this angel <laughs> of the house keeps uh, disturbing her and, and how she uh, tries to ignore this phantom, but this phantom keeps, keeps coming up. And then as the text uh, progresses, she, she murders this phantom with her pen. <laughs> <laughs> but I just like the idea of, of this dual kind of Very role nice. of woman where there's this uh, desire to be this ideal woman, but also the desire not to be that. Um, and so I'm playing with those ideas with the, for the next show, uh, which I'm quite excited about. That's great. Does it have a title yet? I'm thinking something around Angel of the House. Uh, maybe who nice. is the Angel of the House? Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the threads I love with your work is uh, there's this constant play on art inheritances running through it. And that's what I loved about the scarring pads yes. which you showed us yes. near the beginning. There's this very cutting reference to modernism and all these male modernists and their stylistic things. So we get references to them, or Mondrian, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And that to Brancusi, to Man Ray, to Duchamp, to even Oldenburg. The committee. The committee. Yes. But it's substituted with this feminist statement. Mm. And I think that makes the works very powerful. Mm. Yeah. And if you want to comment on that, if you consciously do that, Yes, it is very conscious. It is very conscious. And in a, a work that illustrates that very clearly is uh, uh, the cow's head. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, where uh, I very directly ref reference Picasso's bull's head. And in Picasso's piece, he puts a bicycle seat and a bicycle handlebar together. Uh, and uh, it's early form of assemblage where he makes this bull's head. And I took an iron and a hanger uh, and made uh, a cow's head. Um, and then subsequent to that, two years ago, um, so cow's head was first shown on at uh, Venus at Home. And yeah. then at the Cape Town Art Fair, I got the opportunity to have a solo booth uh, where I made an entire herd of cow's heads, <laughs> which is quite fun. Um, but yes, it is a very conscious uh, reference to modernism and this whole patriarchal uh, art history that we've been taught, patriarchal and Eurocentric and all of that. And of course, close, closer to home, Andres Boiter as well. Yes. Sort of <laughs> entanglements of, of uh, sort of found malleable um, materials. Yes, I love his elephants. Those are my favorite. <laughs> mm. More questions, people. We'd love to hear. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Isha. And hey, hello, everyone. Hey. Um, thank you. Hey, thanks for a lovely presentation and I really love your 
transgressing power exhibition. And now when you were talking about the pecs and how they need two bits, it made me think about Lucy Irigaray and her essay about the two lips, you know, like labia yeah. and how they are touching each other. And that was kind of like a very inspiring and I would say like a empowering feminist text. So maybe that could maybe also somehow word with pegs. Mm. And then I was thinking about what you were saying about witches and spirituality and, and power and the idea, you know, the brooms and the idea of fight and flight as well, which is very cool and, and I really like it. But but then I was also thinking, um, like if if I was thinking about domestic labor or the position of woman in a household, I would imagine that it would go very much in the direction of motherhood as well, mm -hmm. which you actually don't seem to focus on. So maybe mm -hmm. if you could comment on that, whether it's like a just thing which happens or whether it's a deliberate decision. And then that actually made me think about um, how do you think, or are you interested in specifying or making explicit how domestic work and household labor for women differs in different parts in the world? Because when I, when I was looking at the transgressing power, I also read it not in this like a spiritual witch empowerment way, but also like a critique of division of labor, you know, mm. Mm. like that it is certain, certain women and especially in South Africa, where the like pain for domestic labor is very common, and Correct. it's a certain type of women who are doing this labor. So whether mm. you were thinking about that as well, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, to answer your first question, uh, I was interviewed recently around um, uh, my obsession or my uh, focus on the domestic in my work. And just in retrospect, I realized that from my student days, what I was interested in is the routine, our daily routine and how we have this common practice uh, that we routinely do things. And, and it wasn't a conscious decision to, to make work about the domestic, but it happened almost inevitably after I became a mother. And it's only when I look back that I can see that, uh, that my focus changed when I became a mother. And I think it's got to do with how, uh, how visceral an experience it is to, to carry a child, to birth, to, to mother uh, a child, and I have two children, but also how you become so aware of, of what it means to be a woman. Um, and so that wasn't really a conscious thing, but it just kind of happened. Um, I haven't uh, made explicit reference to it in my work because I think it's it's coming from that place already. I did make earlier uh, bodies of work where I painted, exa for example, with, um, with my own breast milk. Uh, and those, I suppose, are more direct uh, references to, to mothering. But... Um, it's there, for me it's there, and I, I don't feel like it needs to be spelled out. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, and then your second question was around uh, uh, yeah, the division of labor and domesticity. Um, I'm acutely aware of how uh, unique the context is in South Africa with um, paid labor and so on. Uh, I find that the works are read quite universally. For example, um, last year my work was shown at the, uh, at the Biennale in uh, Dresden and there was a walkabout with a um, refugee woman from Poland and Uzbekistan and uh, uh, Syria and they, uh, the, the work heard was on, uh, on show there. And I was so moved by how they responded to the work because they could relate to the material. <laughs> and um, so I think that the medium and the messages are quite universal. 
uh, but in my new body of work, I am looking at the, the relationship between the so-called Madam and Eve. Um, it's something that I've been, I think I can't get away from it because it's so prevalent in, in the context in which we come from. Um, Usha, as you're talking about um, domesticity and motherhood, it makes me think immediately of, of the one of your your work I know the best, of course, which is pin code. Oh, yes. Made out of, made out of safety pins. And yes. of course, it was a, a commission for MTN. A pin, pin code was, is, is a sort of, was a, a new technical term. Yeah. But the, the irony of that is that whilst it it um, it referred to um, a technical phenomena, um, a, it, the safety pin is something a well I don't know about mothers these days, but mothers of my era knew all about safety pins. <laughs> <laughs> was 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 this in your mind um, the the kind of that that paradox? as you were doing the work or was it not really anything you you had in mind no and it was way before i was a mother so it couldn't have been <laughs> <laughs> so but interestingly enough aspect. yeah interestingly enough we had made like i think four or five kind of configurations of the pins um mm -hmm. And we had named each pattern so that we would say, because I had a team of people working with me, yes. and I would say, okay, make the spider pattern or make this pattern. And one of them was a, la a large pin with a smaller pin hanging inside. And yes. that one was called Mother and Child. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's lovely. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> mm. Any further questions? Hoshe, could you talk maybe a little bit uh, about the difference of working in gallery contexts and public commissions and whether your works and your themes transfer from one context to another? Yes, and sure. I that. Okay, and then Alex has her hand up for the next question. For a long time, I saw not only two different strands of what it is that I do, but three. And the one was gallery work and one was public artwork. And the third one was around kind of, I didn't have a word for it at that time because I called it community-based work or social development work or artwork that has a social focus. And now I understand that it fits into a, a box of social practice. Um, and increasingly, I'm starting to see them not as separate things. Um, I think I saw them separate because the public artwork was often commissioned and I was always responding to the client or responding to a brief. Um, and, and my gallery work was almost like where my own head was and what my, I was pushing my own agenda. And the social practice work was around the needs of that community or the needs of that organization. But actually, it doesn't make sense that they're all separate because they are all connected. And now I'm consciously um, integrating them more and more. And that's why, for example, for Burning Man, I would propose a big uh, peg. Uh, I was uh, invited to propose a work for um, the High Line in New York. And uh, they're busy with a shortlisting process at the moment. And the work that I proposed for it is a, a giant, I think it would be three, meet, no, six meter high, high heel shoe, but embedded in the shoe is an iron. Um, and so it's quite exciting for me to, to take what I would be doing in a gallery into a public space, to, uh, to take into a, a social space. Um, and uh, and it just it makes total sense now, yeah. Yeah. and not to see them as separate, because they're not. Mm. Alexandra, we'd love to hear from questions. Okay, hi, thank you, Brenda, and thank you very much, Usha, for your talk. Um, my question sort of builds into what Brenda said before about how your work disrupts 
uh, modernist sculptural sculptural modernism in some ways and it could also be seen in relation to other traditions so it reminded me for example about what arthur danto said about um uh, andy warhol and how the brillo box sort of completely broke any idea that the artwork can be a unique thing so mm. my question is has to do with um, the found objects that you use as your prime materials, uh, the pegs that you use are not the same as can be found in a um, in the market in a supermarket these days. Do you deliberately choose them to break up that relationship between the supermarket and the gallery that Danto was talking about? <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the wood the wood of the wooden peg. <laughs> and I think it also, because it reminds me of my childhood and it reminds me of something that's uh, uh, from a time that is not now. And they, they're starting to get increasingly difficult to find mm -hmm. um, because they, you get all these plastic ones and you get padded ones and you get all kinds of interesting shapes. Uh, which I may or may not play with in future, but I'm not attracted to them as much as I am to the to the wooden pegs. Um, in a, a, a lot of ones now that are appearing are Chinese made and they're made from bamboo, but they're just not the same. <laughs> mm. So I'm not sure if it's a, a conscious disruption of the commercial, um, but it is definitely an attraction to something that's more traditional and more authentic in a way, I guess. Uh, for me, it's the feeling of the wooden peg that I'm attracted to more than the plastic one. Thank you. Um, which I can I say something? Yes, our, Bronwyn, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to, when they were speaking about the domesticity, I wanted to say something about the playful nature of your work and the fact that I know that your children do respond to your work yourself and that you in fact have used your son's drawings as part of your work. Correct. And it's like the fact that, that you've, you know, you've gone into school sometimes and done things with the kids with objects that you yourself use. Yes. So um, I'm just mentioning that. I'm not really asking you to respond, although you can. And also yeah. the fact that I do find those wooden pegs still in supermarkets because I use them to hang my washing yes. on the line. Yes, you do, but in but to buy them in bulk is starting yeah. to get difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the bulk that I struggle with. Mm. Um, yes, I mean the kids have been part of my my life uh, very much. When they were much younger, they kind of grew up in the studio. I would like literally be breastfeeding on the one end and making art like working with an angle grinder or a welding machine or the other. Um, but uh, yeah, they are a big part of who I am and, uh, and uh, what my work is. Um, I wanted to say something else about the kids. No, it's gone. I can't yeah. remember. <laughs> other questions, people? Comments? Brenda, you know that your initials are BS. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. I should have taken on my married. <laughs> and you so know BS. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Brown, when I wanted to respond to your comment about the playful nature okay, uh, yeah. of my work, that was it. Um, it's interesting for me that uh, there's often uh, humor in my work and some people get it and some people don't. And some people have very, um, not dark, but very heavy readings of the work. Um, and I think in some works it's there. Uh, a lot of people read uh, gender-based violence into the work. Um, in France, people asked me if the tray works were related to female circumcision, which is not something I had considered at all. But I find it interesting how, how the readings of the work uh, vary so widely. Um, some people physically laugh when they, when they get the humor, and some people don't see it, and that's okay. Uh, I like work that can be interpreted in lots of different ways. 
And I yeah. often find also that an audience can interpret a work in a way that you've not thought of. Yes. Also yes. equally valid. Yeah. And yeah. quite magical when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it when that happens. Yeah. 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 Can you talk about some interesting responses to your work? Perhaps have there been any that have interpreted things in ways you really haven't thought of? Um, Why am I catching you off guard? No. Uh, the, the most exciting for me was the walkabout that I mentioned, where these women were so excited about the work. Uh, and, and one woman actually went to go and grab one of the, the cow's heads off the wall because she wanted to see how it was joined behind. And everybody from the museum was like running behind her to say, you can't do this. But it was such an exciting moment for me because none of them spoke English. We had like four different interpreters interpreting in four or five different languages. And I, I so enjoyed that moment that transcended language where the work spoke to them by virtue of the material and what it had done together. Um, so that was a very exciting moment for me. Uh, that same work when it was shown at the Cape Town Art Fair, a number of people, and I noticed it because it was an interpretation that I had not considered, but that a few people were reading it the same. So the, the iron sits like this and then the hanger kind of sits like horns. And a number of people said that they read into it like ovaries and the fallopian tube, like a, a, a female reproductive system, uh, which was something that I had not thought about at all. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Have you ever taken those ideas <gasps> forward? So, for um, example, yeah, for example, I'm just thinking of those works with trays and uh, vulvas and trays. I think I have, in an anatomical sense, um, yeah. like uh, the Loeb series as well. Um, the lobe is quite bodily, and I've been making a lot of uh, kind of splits and tears and, um, yeah, and the vaginas. Um, so I guess it's there. Other questions or comments? I wish I'd fear those. I just hey, want to does. share, share <laughs> with, with, the, with the group was really the, the work that we did together. I know that I actually just came in and took everything that I could from the studio <laughs> when I did a series called uh, 2020, which was 20 women's stories and 20 years of democracy. And what we did was we took, we took your work into the state theater and was in one little room somewhere where the performance happened and we placed pieces, items, whether it was the brooms at the entrance and we wanted to see how people would respond to it. You know, some people thought that they needed, somebody actually picked up the broom and thought they needed to sweep. Um, <laughs> other people kind of, you know, like, oh my goodness, you, you didn't move this out of the way. <laughs> they thought it was all like stuff just placed. Um, so it was really interesting in, in the way that people responded. And I absolutely love your work and love what you are doing. And this uh, presentation was phenomenal. Thank you so much. And I look forward to working yeah. with the next bits of work that I'm currently um, preparing. Awesome. Thank you, Firdos. You know, when I had the uh, Venus at Home exhibition, it was a show that uh, started in Gramstown, well, the then Gramstown. Um, at the National uh, Arts Festival. It was project managed by uh, Les Con. And uh, in preparation for the show, I knew that I wanted to work with uh, used domestic items. And I'd sent out a call to neighbors and friends and family to donate to me their used brooms and irons and ironing boards and so on. Uh, and then the whole body of work was made with these materials. And so the show um, started at the National Arts Festival. And then I think it was a whole year later that it showed at uh, Johannesburg Art Gallery. 
And when it showed at JAG, I had invited a lot of people who had donated these objects who were not necessarily familiar with the art world. And a lot of them were like my mother's friends, uh, my neighbors, my aunts and their neighbors. And all these people came to the opening. And what was so amazing was they were looking for their items. So they were like, oh, that's my broom. And that's my mop. And that's my iron. <laughs> and it was such a great connection for them to see what had become of their objects, but that they were connected to the work by, the, by their objects, which was great. Perhaps you could just talk a little bit about um, differences with your recent works where you've been touching up objects more. Um, so that recognizability has been less of a factor. Yes. Factors. Mm. Has that had changes in audience reception? Hmm, interesting question. I think definitely when the work is less uh, uh, broken up or less obscured, it maintains a certain, uh, I almost want to say it's not, it's not, it's more than history. It almost maintains the, the energy of where it came from. And the specifics of it are not so relevant for me. It's, it's more the feeling of it. Um, so, uh, I'm acutely aware of that when I work with these objects. And I think by cutting them up, I'm kind of denying them that, but I'm also aware of how there's a, uh, a collectivity about that, um, that, that in the uh, separation and bringing back together, there's something, com yeah, a togetherness, uh, which I think is a calling for at the time, at, at this time. Uh, there is a need for more and more of that, uh, a, common con a common kind of uh, vision and a common direction. Uh, I don't know how that changes in the receptivity of the work. I think definitely there was a connection for people to recognize their particular objects. Uh, in France, when I'd asked people for their brooms, so many people came very excitedly wanting to contribute their broomsticks and their brooms. And obviously they couldn't recognize it at the exhibition, but they were very excited to see what had happened uh, with whatever they had donated. The fact that they couldn't identify it, I think was okay. They were still equally excited to know that they were part of it, to know that they have contributed to it. Um, yeah. So the used quality is still something within them. The fact that you're using brooms that aren't new in yes. those instances. Mm. And, I, and now, because I need so many of them, I've started mixing new ones and used ones. And I can't use new ones because they all have the same tone. <laughs> I mean, a variety of tones. <laughs> so I've so been, how uh, do you put out a call for brooms? <laughs> I have done so on Facebook. I've been uh, connecting with, I've connected with somebody who does, uh, who owns a cleaning company and she works for hotels and so on. And she often brings me like a bucket full of <laughs> used brooms. Amazing. And I've, I've made friends with several uh, uh, city, uh, like the refuse dumps. And so <laughs> when they have like five or six, they give me a call and I come and collect them. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> and I think that's a big part of what the work is. You know, it, it's uh, it's behind the scenes, but um, I, you know, I think people people can feel that, even mm. if it's not uh, spelled out explicitly. Yeah, it's that patina of use mm. on the work, which is important. Yeah. It is, and it and that all started with the Venus at Home body of work. Um, that was like the. It was an approach that was new for me to begin with these found objects.
Usha, thank you so much for joining us. This has been wonderful, so fascinating. Thank you, Brenda. Mm. And the links you've drawn between mm. your works, which are so complex and moving, you know. So, thank you. Mm. Oh, it's really been wonderful to have you here with us. Very nice. Thank yeah. you so much for talking to us, Usha. It's my absolute pleasure. Uh, yeah, and it's wonderful to see everybody again. Thank you, Brenda, for not just today, but for taking such a huge interest in my work. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows, but Brenda has written about my work on several occasions. Uh, one of the books are being published right now. And um, I love how you take what I'm doing and, and just bring your own academic readings to the work. And thank you for that support. It's wonderful to have that. It's a great pleasure. You know, that was cool. Yeah. Thank you, Rosha. Thank, Thank you, guys. So much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank everyone. you for arranging it, Brenda. It was so great. <laughs>